I'm very pleased to be able to host the event today. Uh, and given our short time here with the general, because we need to really wrap this up precisely at uh, 1230, uh, I will truncate my introductory remarks. But one thing I do want to note is that we're very privileged to be able to offer this opportunity through an endowment for General uh, Ray Davis. Uh, as many of you know, he's the Georgia Tech uh, Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, and he received that for his valor not only on campus, but of course on the battlefield. <laughs> and so we're very uh, uh, pleased to be able to host these types of events. Um, as many of you know, our guest speaker today, General uh, James Cartwright, uh, served as the eighth uh, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and that was noteworthy for, uh, for a number of reasons. One, he was the first Marine to do so. Um, he also served two presidents in that capacity. Uh, and he also served during a period where we were constantly at war against different types of foes. Um, and prior to that posting, he uh, uh, was the commander of Str U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, again, noteworthy because of the fact that he oversaw the transformation of that command to include not only nuclear weapons, but missile defense, cyber, uh, prompt global strike, um, space issues. So he is a, a real um, renaissance man, if you will, uh, from the command uh, authority perspective. Um, on a personal note, let me note that um, he's also uh, very instrumental in, uh, from an operational perspective and bringing the wealth of his military experience for really thinking hard about the road to zero. Uh, and he has really um, worked with others, both in his official capacity and since he's retired uh, from the military, to really sort out some of the institutional and infrastructural issues that are not just obstacles, but may be keys to unlocking the promise uh, of deep reductions in the standing nuclear arsenal. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, General Cartwright. <clears throat> it's going to have to be the podium. Okay. Did I mention that I hate podiums? Um, okay, I, I'm looking at this group and I'm finding it hard to believe that you want to spend an hour on nuclear weapons, but um, uh, so we're going to sprinkle it a little bit, okay? And, and I'll do a little bit on the nuclear side and then I'll do a little bit on um, uh, technology and where it's going in, inside of the department um, and then we'll go Q&A and you can go any place you want to go on that. We'll, we'll talk any, any subject you want to. Um, and because you know of, of the plethora of uniforms out there I think the uh, start with the vice chairman uh, job and just give you a sense of, uh, of four years of doing that, uh, two terms, and what, what the routine was like. But basically, um, given that there were two wars running pretty much constantly the whole time, and they were on the opposite side of the earth, so they were in, at night when we were in the day here. Uh, day normally started at 5 um, at, at the Pentagon, and you show up at 5. There's a change of venue there that one team comes in and another watch team goes off. The new watch team, first thing we did was uh, go through the list and read name by name those that died the day before. Okay. That was to keep inside of the Pentagon. You can get disconnected from reality and part of it was to understand that what they were doing had significant consequence. And So that's the way the day started. We did that from five to about six. At six, I got briefed on anything acquisition-wise that was going on, all of the new capabilities that the field was demanding or the new needs that they had and what we were doing in the technology world to, to fix that and how fast we could get it out there. At eight o'clock, get briefed up and you went to the White House. I stayed at the White House until about two o'clock in the afternoon. From there, generally over to the Hill and spend about an hour to two hours with the members trying to keep them up to speed on what was going on. And then one day out of the week, instead of going to the Hill, we'd go to the Supreme Court, talk to them, because they needed to know, they needed to understand a lot of the issues going on on the battlefield. Okay, none of that did I get in OCS, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, and, uh, and none of that did I ever envision what I would be part of. 
but then at about seven o'clock, um, then you'd start to nap. And you know, generally you'd get hopefully two or three hours during the night. But anything that was needed on the other side of the earth, anything that Petraeus wanted, any issues, any permissions, any authorities, any place in the world, basically took place at night. And so you worked those at night um, uh, as, as best you could. And then you got ready to go again at five. And so that was the day in the life. Um, and it generally went that way um, for four, four straight years. Um, I wouldn't aspire to it. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. And uh, I'm just now starting to catch up on my sleep. Um, on the strategic side, on the nuclear side, um, you know, I, I, when I went to STRATCOM, it was kind of with a mandate to change what we were doing because the idea that nuclear weapons were really our only deterrent and our only capability on a global scale um, was, was one, limiting our ability to do business in the world because um, when all else fails, a nuclear weapon is not necessarily the answer and almost always is not. And so what are the new capabilities out there? And so I picked up, as, as you heard, space and cyber and um, directed energy and all of the intelligence organizations, um, missile defense, all of those capabilities came under, under STRATCOM with the idea that netting them together and starting to replace what was the old strategic triad of, of the land-based missiles, the submarines, and the uh, bombers, was, was the alternative to that was found in all of these other capabilities. And so a lot of what we tried to do in the reductions as they occurred on nuclear weapons through the treaty series, and remember we went from somewhere in the neighborhood of rough order of magnitude out in the public forest, 35,000 of these weapons, um, when I finished at STRATCOM with New START, we were down to 1,550, okay? So that's a pretty significant change. Um, that has occurred really without a lot of hype, um, quite frankly, uh, unless you just happen to be a wonk and live in this world of, of nuclear weapons. Um, and, oh, by the way, you know, last time I checked anyway, they haven't seen 300 ICBMs coming over the pole at the United States. Um, that doesn't mean that nuclear weapons are no longer useful, but it does mean that there are other capabilities out there that nuclear weapons moved from a status where they were the guarantor of our sovereignty in the Cold War, and there were just two of us out there that were, were really in this game, us and the Soviet Union at that time, and we had a dialogue, and we had a language, we had process and procedures that allowed us to talk back and forth and understand when one was upset with the other, when you were doing something that we didn't like, and we had venues both verbally, and we would do things like pull the bombers out and park them on the end of the runway and show them loaded with nuclear weapons to demonstrate to the other that we're not happy with what's going on right now and you need to change, okay? That that whole dialogue was 40 years, you know, of work between us to get to that point. That was a great dialogue. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that world is gone, <laughs> okay? That world of a bilateral, two superpowers, two nuclear weapon states, that's really gone. Um, and the problems that we have today are not necessarily readily solved by the fact that we have nuclear weapons or that we might use nuclear weapons, et cetera. And, and for me, you know, um, in working in this area, conflict uh, is really the result of your diplomatic or your dip diplomatic tools basically running out of juice, okay? I mean, you can have sanctions, you can have dialogues, et cetera, but at some point, if your adversary does not does not feel compelled to change their behavior, then you've got to resort, resort to force. But you're resorting to force in order to get them to come back to the table. You don't end conflict with war. You end it in negotiation, okay? Because um, no matter how compelling your, your victory was, you're not going to get everything you want when you go to the treaty table, okay? And so the idea here is how do you start to fill in those spaces? And there are two gaps that we deal with, um, you know, when we stood up 
uh, strategic command in this new form. The first gap is that gap of, okay, I have conventional capabilities and I have diplomacy. The space between diplomacy and conventional, I have a big gap. And sometimes I have to go to war before I really want to go to war because I couldn't let the economic sanctions play out or I couldn't keep them at the table long enough or whatever the reason, dog ate my homework. It doesn't matter, you know, you, you run out of juice at some point and so you then move into conflict. The other gap is I'm in conflict and I'm not winning and the guy's not giving up and so now my alternative is do I go to nuclear weapons? Well, 90% of the time the answer is no. But what do we have? You know, we have this huge, very expensive strategic force and we're pretty much self-deterred from using it. Okay? What president wants to start a nuclear exchange? Okay? Um, and so the question was, what are my alternatives? How do I start to fill in those gaps? And for the most part, those gaps started to be filled in by things like cyber, things like directed energy, um, electromagnetic pulse, rail guns, technologies that allowed us to, to do a couple of things. One, they have graduated effects. Okay? Cyber is an example. I can go from influence to destruction and I got a whole bunch of steps in between that I can take. So it's not just on off switch. I can start with you and I can say okay you're not really making me feel good about this so I'm gonna do this to you. It's just temporary you know take your medicine but we ha but we can manage the escalatory ladder and we have a lot of tools in that escalatory ladder where there was a complete gap and void before and at the high end it's the same thing if you look at at, uh, at uh, directed energy I mean directed energy is just now starting to come into its own the capabilities etc a lot of that work is being done here uh, and other universities but it has graduated effects at the low end with, with, uh, with microwaves and millimeter wave, I can basically look at a crowd like this and say, okay, you're all hiding in the grass, and I can just direct that energy out in a non-lethal way, and, and I can guarantee you that you will feel like you're on fire, and there will be absolutely no injury. I mean, it's that precise. And I could take that all the way up to basically intercepting a, 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 an ICBM in flight, with enough energy to destroy it. Okay, so, so those types of weapons have a couple of things that go for them. They have these graduated effects. The other thing is that the world that we're living in now, in the, in the era of the Cold War, they were on one side of the earth and we were on the other side of the earth. And we had a couple of oceans in between us. Okay, that made for, okay, I got some decision time. You're not happy, I pull the bombers out, you still keep be making me unhappy. We talk, we do all of those things. Even if it got down to, which it never had to get down to, launching weapons, we still had time during that flight to, to make decisions, to try to do something else, uh, to survive, etc. Okay. The world that we live in today, you can look in the Middle East, you can look in South Asia, it's neighbor v. neighbor. You know, in, in military parlance, flash to bang, from the time it launches till the time it impacts is usually less than 10 seconds. Okay? Not a lot of decision time. Okay? Not a lot of time to react. Not a lot of time to assess. Um, not a lot of time to think of alternative venues by which to do this. Things like cyber and directed energy move at the speed of light. They actually do get inside of those types of decision lines. They do give you decision time. They do give you opportunity for different effects and controlling escalation and not letting it get out of control. That's their power. That's their promise, number one. Number two, there's this pesky little thing called grand strategy. Um, you know, for me, when you talk about grand strategy, it is the matching of ends and means. Okay, so it's, it's great to, to imagine a capability like, gee, I wish I had 20 aircraft carriers. There's that pesky thing of affordability. If you don't have the resource, it's just an hallucination. It's a nice wish, but you don't have it. Okay, today we have problems in that um, our ability to afford large munitions, precision munitions, the things that we've been dealing with, 
if I'm going out in an Aegis, and I'm going to use Navy examples here today because it looks like it's overwhelming me, um, but, <laughs> but um, if I've got my Aegis out there and now I've got a swarm of small boats, okay, and I only carry, you know, let's make it 30, um, 30 Tomahawks or 30 SM3 or SM6, you pick it, okay. So I'm going to expand two and three hundred million dollar rounds against small patrol boats, and then my, when my magazine's empty, I have to go home. Okay, that, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so for Navy, and this is kind of the transition into the um, kind of the future work. Navy, as an example, right now has put their first directed energy weapon on an Aegis. Okay, for things like small boats, okay, with the capability of destroying them or stunning them, or just lighting them up and making them feel hot, um, about, I think they advertise publicly, 87 cents a shot. Okay? It's a fundamentally different game. If I'm Israel and Palestine and I'm using Iron Dome to shoot down rockets that cost the, the Palestinians maybe $500 at the most, okay, with a rocket that's about, a, you know, close to $100 million a shot, it's, it's something you have to do, but it's not going to last long. Okay? The, the cost equation just doesn't work for you. The imposition of cost is supposed to be on your adversary, not on yourself. Um, and so you know, these types of technologies are, are changing the, the ability to stay on station, to have magazines of weapons that are almost limitless, to address targets at speeds with decision times that are fundamentally different than the game that we're having today. Okay. This is really where warfare is going, okay? and it's a partnership that, that occurs between man and machine out there. Um, this activity um, that we're dealing with right now and trying to understand where ma man fits into the chain, whether it be in the nuclear chain or in the conventional arms chain, where do you put the person? Okay, the drone issue. Okay. How do we start to look at that? Uh, again, Navy just just finished uh, doing their op eval on unmanned um, ribs, uh, the, the inflatable boats uh, that go out and basically do protection of the, of the vessel, um, you know, in tight quarters and, and in contested waters. Um, the first carrier-based air that is unmanned um, is, is out there this year. It's those kinds of things that are going to provide the leverage, the same as occurring underwater. More nations now are buying underwater unmanned vessels um, than, than they have trained people for in the regular uh, submarine force. So in other words, the submarine force now is growing much larger than it was, mainly because they have all of this robotic activity that's going on underwater. I mean, it's a fundamentally different game. Um, that's that's the Navy for you all that you're walking into. Um, it comes with some pretty significant issues culturally. It comes with some, you know, difficult issues from the standpoint of law of armed conflict and how we prosecute war and all of those things. But it's not going away. And it's, it is in, in the times of reduced resource availability. If you go back and look at the Gulf War as an example, um, out of the Gulf War, we, when we drew down the size of the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and pulled them down, um, what we did in lieu of that was kind of three technologies. Precision weapons, which really fundamentally changed the game for the Air Force in particular. They got rid of about 50% of their force because of precision munitions were so effective. Um, uh, the night. Night vision devices. We got. We, we basically had those coming out of that that activity. Those kinds of things are game changers. They change the way the business works. What we're looking for now are these unmanned capabilities. If you go back and look at precision weapons, you say, okay, I got rid of some airplanes. Yeah, I got rid of airplanes. I got rid of 60% of the army's rolling stock as a result of precision munitions. I didn't have to move that many weapons to the front. 60% of all of the trucks and escort vehicles and everything else that had to move gear, that's, that's the kind of thing that's going on. As we look at that today, that's the type of stuff that we're trying to find for leverage. We're finding that in these weapons like cyber, like directed energy, like rail guns, 
you know, rail guns, we put those together back in uh, probably the mid 90s when we really did a lot of the work on them, but they just weren't ready for prime time, so we gave them to the amusement parks. Every, every roller coaster you ride is a rail gun. It's the exact same technology. They perfected it, they commercialized it, and then we took it back. Okay? And instead of a roller coaster, we got a bullet, but you know, it's the same thing. It's the exact same technology. Um, you know, that's, that's the type of stuff that we're looking for to do fundamentally different. Um, these man-machine activities, I think, are critical and they will be a part of, of your service. Um, if you look, and I'll, this will be my last example, and we'll go to the Q&A, but if you look at um, uh, medical uh, as an example, in the Civil War, the military in, invented the concept called triage, and that was how you cared for large numbers, mass casualty type activity, people with life-threatening injuries. Okay? That's how the military did it. That became the basis we did hospitals, etc. You know, go back maybe a little before your time, but this show called MASH was really Korea and, and how we did triage out in the field. We had doctors and we sent doctors out and they had hospitals out there and they, they would try to treat casualties. The problem was if you didn't have the right kind of doctor for the injury that you faced, the guy was kind of out of luck. At its very best in the Gulf War, triage saved 66% of the people that were inducted into the hospital off the battlefield. That was, that, was your, that was the likelihood that you were going to survive, 66%. That was at its very best. Okay? In, in Afghanistan, we basically trashed triage for something called an hour to live. We had new technologies associated with coagulants and controlling blood and all that type of stuff. But when we walked up to you on the battlefield and said, okay, here's what I've got. And you look at the guy and he's got burns. Okay? You, you turn to your device and you say, okay, I need the guy from San Antonio at the burn center the on-call surgeon. He looks at the guy, he says, okay, do this, this, and this, patch him up and get him in the airplane. That kind of activity, we got rid of all of those hospitals, we got rid of all of that stuff out in the field, and now we're bouncing between 98 and 99 percent of survivability. So I can say to you that if I can get to you, you will live. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's the kinds of technologies that we're dealing with. Not having the surgeon out there, having the surgeon someplace where he can deal independent of physical location of the problem. Okay? Independent of that. It's a fundamental game changer. That's the types of technologies that we're dealing with. That's what we're going after today. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I got some nuclear. I promised I would. I got some military and I got some just general um, interesting technology. And we can go in any direction that you'd like to go for the Q&A and we'll go as long as I can stay. Do you want to field the questions yourself? Or do you want to I'm, I'm okay with pointing and... Several of them have to go to a class. That's why they're leaving. That bad of a speech, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, um, given the rise of unmanned systems and you know, popular, popularity of things like the Cyber Command, how do you, um, do you have any advice for distinguishing yourself as a leader as opposed to a manager given the change in, from conventional warfare into different uh, climates? Yeah, um, paint the word leadership, you know, kind of in, in one venue of, uh, there's this image of, you know, the guy standing out on the battlefield saying, follow me, those types of activities. That's still around, but the issue that we're looking for, particularly from senior officers, um, commanding officers, etc., is really an, an understanding of the partnering here that goes on. And so what we're looking for is the art of war. I got a lot of machines here. I got a lot of capabilities, more than I've ever had historically. Somebody has to put them together in the art of war and present them against an adversary in a way that's very compelling and makes them change whatever behavior they're doing. That's where it's going to come from, A. B, um, on the leadership side, just small unit leadership, you know, with, with a group. Um, I'm trying to figure out the nicest way to say this, but um, the, the gents that we had, the sergeant 
Cartwrights of the world that are out there trying to lead a, a squad or a platoon uh, into into battle versus Sergeant Cartwright who is sitting in some uh, bunker here in the United States controlling a vehicle with a team of ten and they're controlling vehicles any place in the world um, on any given day they walk in and they say okay you're now working in Iraq today okay tomorrow you walk into work and now you're working in Afghanistan or Africa or wherever okay my team has to perform they have to do it I have to lead them to do it I have to demonstrate capability I have to help them through hard points I have to put them together in groupings that make them successful I'm responsible for all of those things and what we're finding is the stress is equal if not greater we have just as many PTSD cases with drone operators as we do with field guys okay that's no different the harder part for the drone guys is they carry it home at night um, to their families and that's not working out real well for the divorce rate okay they're higher not lower and so we've got a lot of social issues that we're going to have to work our way through that come under the guise of leadership so the leadership that we're looking for has really got more challenges than they had in the past I mean I can remember m my first day down at Quantico um, with, with my wife and the first thing they said to her was if we wanted you to have a wife we would have issued you one okay and that was that was the thought process at that time okay it's a fundamentally different world that we're in now and the challenges that come with family the challenges that come with optics that can see better than your eyes can see and therefore see the destruction real up close and personal and verify it and those those are equally stressful independent of your geographical location so leadership is going to be probably more challenged in this world than it was you know in the okay follow me um, I'm in the rod and gun club uh, it's, it's going to be different Thank you. sir My question regards the way deterrence works in the China-U.S. relation. Um, China has, over the last 18 or so years, developed a, a strategy of area access, anti-denial anti area access, uh, anti-access area denial, uh, to exclude U.S. forces from the vicinity of the Taiwan Straits for a period long enough to secure them, to allow their forces to secure the islands. The U.S. response has been the air-sea battle doctrine which includes early deep strikes against the Chinese missile facilities deep in Chinese territory. Were that to happen, uh, the options for the PRC to retaliate would be limited and they'd probably, if they moved against the U.S. bases in the Pacific area, Guam, uh, Saipan, Micronesia, Yokosuka, and so forth, uh, they could well choose nuclear weapons because that's the only way such a strike would be effective. And what would the U.S. response be then? Escalation to a central nuclear exchange? My question is, how do you think deterrence works in the, in the contemporary Sino-U.S. relations? How should it work? Yeah. Um, you addressed the second gap that I highlighted, the gap between general purpose force and then having to move to nuclear and not having enough tools in between as alternatives. And uh, the question right now under the guise of strategic stability is how much missile defense do I introduce into the Pacific um, as a counter to that type of threat, okay? And how destabilizing does that become? Or is there a better approach, and uh, this is hypothetical, but is there a better approach of, okay, let's sit down and get together here there's no reason for you to build 35,000 nuclear weapons um, in this issue but let's agree that what we're going to do is we're going to put our defenses on alert and we're going to have missile defense in both places so neither guy is going to be convinced that they can actually win and, and persevere uh, in that exchange a, but there are going to be a lot more escalatory steps to get to the nuclear decision you may get to the nuclear decision, you know, that, that always is there and, and always worrisome. But one, I don't need to keep as large an arsenal that way. I manage my escalation and I get a lot more opportunities to introduce, you know, the opportunity for decision makers to come to alternative venues. And so that's right now kind of how I see it playing out is 
you know, at what point and how much do we put out there, how much of it is fixed and how much of it is mobile on Aegis and, and other platforms, and how are we going to start to think about that. That also then takes away the three island chain construct because now you have a counter to that that says, okay, maybe I'm going to get closer. Um, maybe I'm willing to now because I have a reasonable shield. You know, it's not impermeant and it's not perfect, but it's going to be good enough that I may take the risk. Then you don't want me taking that risk. So the question here is not to get too out of whack on strategic stability, but to start to introduce alternatives that have more choices and more decision time in the equation than jumping to nuclear. And, and that's the problem we have right now is it's too easy to jump to, nu to nuclear, you know, in, a, in an exchange out there. Can I just pick up one point on that? I mean, some people talk about the dilemma of superiority. Uh, and this is especially problematic with nuclear weapons and moving off of nuclear weapons because on the one hand, for all of these technologies that you're mentioning, we have superiority in that, in that domain, those domains. And so as we are offering to move off of nuclear weapons and graduate that, that process, uh, we may be, uh, one, making the other nuclear weapons states more insecure and therefore clutching to their nuclear weapons uh, more so, and the non-nuclear weapon states therefore also feeling increasingly insecure and then having an incentive to acquire nuclear weapons. So at the time that we're talking about moving off into something that's not usable, into a set of technologies that are usable, we could be creating these perverse incentives for both the possessors today and of tomorrow. And so I was wondering, how do you mm -hmm. grapple with that dilemma? So that's, that's the stability issue. And so, you know, my approach, you know, and it's a approach, it's not the approach. Um, my approach is that in the triad, again, you start to introduce these capabilities as part of the triad. And as they demonstrate the credibility that you need, the flexibility and agility to adapt to the targets, as they actually are demonstrated and work, then you can say, okay, how much of this works? Does it work to the point that I can get rid of nuclear weapons in this, in this particular venue? Or I could at least reduce them down to some substantially lower level than where I am today. And you introduce capabilities, demonstrate those capabilities, demonstrate the will to use those capabilities, all the elements of deterrence. And once you've done that in that kind of confidence building activity, then you make a decision that, okay, I'm going to start to reduce. And I'm going to reduce here because these weapons, these capabilities, whether they're missile defense or, or interceptors or whatever, are working. And they're demonstrating they're working, number one. And number two, I've demonstrated the will to use them and use them effectively. And so those are the elements of deterrence that allow you to back some of these things out. And, it, and it's not an overnight activity. It is, it is a demonstration. It is an evolution that will occur. Um, anybody that's looking for that golden document that says zero and, and it happens, that's just not going to happen. I mean, you, no country is going to take the risk of letting go of the trapeze until they're sure the other, the other other hook is out there that you can grab onto. And uh, so that, that's my sense of it. Great. Howdy, sir. I'm Mike Meyer from the Department of Nuclear Engineering. What deterrence options and options are we developing for insurgencies and terrorists? Yeah. Um, you have seen with terrorism, um, and I'll start down at the home and tactical level and work my way up. but. But your, your passive defenses, um, which are designed to remove the objective, so you look around here, you see standoff distances, things like that, that allow us to push threats away from critical infrastructure, away from buildings, etc. Passive defenses, hardening the target, which in law enforcement is remove the objective. That's, that's, that's what you're trying to do. So if I am trying to hijack your airplane or if I am trying to walk into a mall and blow myself up, I'm making it difficult and I'm certainly introducing into your mind whether you'll be successful at doing that and whether you'll kill anybody or not, okay, which is your objective. And so you start at the passive defenses and you harden your infrastructure, you harden your communication lines and stuff like that. Okay, so that, that's kind of step one. The second step in this terrorism type activity is that you now start to set up, and this was really enabled by the non-Luger activities and non-proliferation, but you harden the borders. 
and you exchange data in the borders so you know who's passing through and who isn't, where they're passing through, how they're passing through, and what their condition is and what, what they're carrying with them. So that's, that's kind of step number two. Step number three is that you demonstrate the connection between law enforcement and military, so usually special operations guys on the military side, and the ability to say to anybody in the world that if you do this, it may take me a while, but I will find you and I will come get you. Um, and you make it very clear that that's what you're going to do. And then at the, at the more um, aggregated up levels uh, of sophistication and capability, things like North Korea's venture into um, nuclear weapons and, and missiles, you start to build the defenses that introduce into the equation a substantial amount of uncertainty on their part that they can do something quick and then sue for peace and, not, and get away with it. And so you're trying to work your way into a set of capabilities that allow you to do that. And then the final thing is obviously is that you just go in and say, you know you're not going to win. I'm going to win and I'm going to perse persevere even if I have to go up to the nuclear level. But, but if you keep doing this, you're going to have a hard time of it. And so it's, 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 a, it's a graduation all the way up of, of activities. And if you skip any of those, that's a vulnerability. And that's where people will start to look and funnel. And we start to find those, but we have done a reasonable job, knock on wood, it's not perfect, of removing the objective, getting standoff distances, getting hardened uh, capabilities. We've done a reasonable job on the borders and entry and, and exit and the ability to travel. Um, we've done a reasonable job with missile defense, but we've got holes in this that are still being plugged. And I think the one that concerns me the biggest is really is this Ebola thing. Not Ebola itself, but the idea of bio um, and, and our ability to deal with that issue and the terrorist side of the equation is going to be pretty tough. And, and you can see that all the best laid plans don't tend to go the last mile and we're finding the little disconnects um, which are costing lives in, in, in the bio side of the equation. And, if you think attribution is tough on the cyber side, attribution in the bio side is going to be really difficult. Um, so, here in the center. Thanks, Neil Shulman. Uh, to, uh, from a big picture standpoint, uh, humans will kill other humans they don't even know just because they're in one cluster versus another. And uh, I wonder if there's any way to connect humans rather than by country, religion, uh, but by good things they do, you know, because they're good people in every country and yet they kill each other. Mm -hmm. And if they could re-cluster uh, on humanitarian things through the internet or whatever become friends, there might be less likelihood of that happening. The second is, uh, as nuclear weapons get more and more sophisticated, one dangerous person getting hold of something in any country can obviously be horrendous. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if there's any way to reverse that. And the third question has to do with drone at, drone attacks. When we use, uh, when we go through like immunization programs or whatever, I think in Pakistan to try to find out information about drones, and then they're nervous about relating to us in any way relating to immunizations for kids because of using that tactic. Okay. Um, let's see if I can go back to these. Uh, the construct that people will always, you know, find reasons to um, have quarrel, so to speak, um, you know, is true. I mean, you have to realize as you try to build national security apparatus that which you can actually control and that which you probably can't. And at, at least to the extent that you can separate as far as possible from each other that which is law enforcement and mischief and that which is war and impose substantial costs on anybody who wants to work at the war level tends to separate the two su sufficiently that when you end up at the war level 
you know the adversary is committed, okay, and that this is not going to be, you know, just chop the head off the snake and it goes away. It's not going to happen that way. Um, on the, um, what was the second one? About the single, about the oh. diffusion of warheads to non-state actors. Or yeah, the, the individual terrorist that happens to get a hold of a nuclear device. Um, This is a difficult discussion, okay? But, uh, you know, the, the single device, as devastating as it might be, is not existential. It is not going to wipe out an entire country, assuming the country of the United States size or something like that. It's not going to wipe out an entire country. We would recover from something like that, okay? It's the unknown number, whether it's 50, 100, 500 of these weapons going off that becomes existential, okay, can't be recovered from. And nobody knows what that number is, but clearly that number is going down, not up. In other words, less weapons are going to be required to do that. And uh, the National Intelligence Community has three, three venues by which they declare existential. Um, uh, one is um, the outer space asteroid hitting the Earth. You know, the, um, the second is a pandemic. And the third, which has just recently been added, is some number of nuclear weapons going off. Okay. That, those are, think of dinosaurs, those are the end of a species. That's, that's existential. And a single terrorist, while devastating, is probably not likely to be existential. Um, and so we have to try to have perspective in doing that. And it's really difficult because you know as well as I do, the towers, whatever, let's just say that that was 3,000 people and now we've given five to 10,000 lives for those 3,000 people on our own side. The normal calculus is not is not the way you do business on this. It's, it, there is a lot of emotion associated with this. And so, you know, it, it's a difficult discussion to say, okay, one nuclear weapon loose in New York City is not a big deal. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it is not existential. I think his last question was, is there a counterproductive element to the intelligence that we're acquiring for UAVs for the biosecurity yeah, challenges? Yeah, um, that's a good one. Um, you know. I, the thing that really concerns me about the drone de debate is that the drone is the issue, not the fact that we're willing to go into a country that we're not at war with, violate their sovereignty, kill somebody, and leave. That has nothing to do with the drone. I mean, I can do it with an M16 if you want me to do it with an M16. The issue is the principle on which we're doing it. And, and the change in principle because of the empowerment of individuals to communicate and, and, and actually commit threatening acts out there. And is that the way of the world order to come? Is there a better thought process in that? Do you want to have an alternative venue that you do that by with only final recourse being to invade? Um, and, and I think people have, unfortunately, to our disadvantage, equated unmanned to that problem. And it's not the drone. It's not the drone. That's not the issue here. I mean, if we didn't have drones, we'd have snipers. <laughs> or you pick it. I mean, there's any number of ways that we could do this kind of stuff. None of them are without violating somebody's sovereignty, though. And that's the issue here is, heretofore, we either declared war or declared an area of hostility before we would send military forces into violate sovereignty. And the question is, have we drifted off of that now? And I'm not saying we have, but it's certainly a perception that could be adjudged out there. General, I'm John Patrick Floyd on Nuclear Engineering and International Relations. Um, I wanted to ask you two things about these recent conflicts in Eastern Europe and kind of the long-term effects that it may have. One, um, do you see that um, that conflict driving uh, increased defense spending or increased responsibility for their own defense in Europe. And number two, um, yeah, well, let's just stick. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, my sense is, yes, there will be some episodic um, spending that occurs, but um, my worry is that Eastern versus Western in Europe, that one side feels threatened and the other side feels oh hum. And so the likelihood that that resource allocation, reallocation, will be substantial and will persist is probably low. Um, until there's a, a, a much greater imperative than there is today. Um, you know, and leadership is trying to do what they feel is right in supporting, um, you know, with additional military forces, presence, verbiage, diplomacy, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm not really seeing a reallocation of resource that is substantial. In other words, I don't see most, no, there are no additional countries getting up to the 2% level of spending in NATO. Um, there is no recruiting going on for f military forces, you know, beyond the levels that they're at right now. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether um, uh, the next incursion changes their mind at all, and there will be another incursion, there's no doubt about that. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic in this. I'm sorry, the other thing I recall is uh, this, uh, you know, it's clear that kind of norms and lines were blurred in that action, and it made it difficult to act with consensus. Um, what effect do you think this is going to have in uh, the Red to Zero for various countries that, you know, like Ukraine, have given up nuclear weapons, or other countries that are in a similar situation? The inability, anyway, this kind of obfuscation and difficulty acting together, how do we combat that? And, yeah. Um, you have to combat that independent of what happens in the outside world. I mean, you know, nothing could have happened and you still would have to combat it. You have to build the confidence in the alternative capabilities, demonstrate them, demonstrate your will to use them and that you practice it and all of that kind of stuff, that it is um, manageable, um, et cetera, collateral damage, things like that. And then, then you make decisions about gentle drawdowns, you know, big drawdowns, whatever is appropriate at the time based on a leadership decision. Um, but absent demonstrating capability, nobody's going to go with a promise that cyber is going to answer the problem. You know, you're going to have to demonstrate that cyber will, in fact, give you the capability that you have given up, at least in, in a particular venue, maybe not in all. And, and you'll have to develop capabilities over time. And so this is a transition, not a statement and an, and an act. Good afternoon, sir. Excuse me. Midshipman Third Class Lewis. I really uh, wanted to talk about ISIS a little bit. Sure. How do we effectively combat that threat? And also, what are our, uh, our country's major strengths and weaknesses with regards to that insurgency group? You guys are going for the easy questions. Um, my answer to this has not been well received in Washington, so uh, don't feel like the Lone Ranger if you don't agree with me. But um, if you look at the demographics, if you look at the energy issues, if you look at climate, if you look at all of those things, wealth, etc., and you go to the Middle East, or you generally go from 20 north to 20 south off the equator, um, you have um, a growing population, even in the face of war. This is the first time that we've come out of, of war where that population between 17 and 33 males has grown, not declined. Normally war declines that population. It's grown. The resource available for those individuals to earn a living, feed their families, home, uh, house their families, etc., is not there. The energy resources are. And so what you have is a population that looks around the world and says, my way to break out here is education. So they go get educated, and there's still not enough resource for them to get a job, etc. And so you're, that's there, A. B, you have a, a a challenge in the reconciliation of, of a group that didn't really participate in the Reformation, you know, never really bought into the Westphalian state model, um, and are trying to figure out how to make the transitions. Um, 
And now you have a group that its citizens have been empowered with social media, which if at nothing else, social media is probably the most powerful tool that we've seen to undermine a government, okay? To take away credibility, to reduce the credibility and undermine. It has almost no power to put a new government together. So it's very destructive in that it tears these things down. So for me, think 50 to 100 years. And ISIS is just, a, you know, it's just one element of it. So when you have a challenge like that, normally in policy the thought process is similar to a doctrine. Okay, what is it I'm going to stand for? Because I can't play whack-a-mole everywhere. Okay? What am I going to stand for and how am I going to stand for it and how am I going to back up the fact that I stand for it? Am I going to stand for the sovereignty of borders? Okay, am I going to stand for the sovereignty of life? If I try to chase that, I got a problem in, in that people, well, he left, but people will tend to kill people for forever uh, as far as I know. So my sense here is ISIS is a symptom like Al-Qaeda was. There are connections that you can find and there'll be connections to whatever follows after ISIS. The big transition that has occurred through ISIS and through Yemen is that they have stopped trying to be pure terrorists and they're now trying to control territory. That's the transition that's occurred. So if this country decides that what we really want to stand for is the sanctity of borders, the ability of nation states to decide their own way forward, um, the access to the commons and the ability to work in global norms in those commons. If those are going to be our doctrine, okay, then what do we engage in and what don't we engage in? If you see something out there, will you know, okay, that's something the United States is going to do something about. That's not necessarily. Um, right now, if we have capability, we just commit it. Um, you know, and it's not a problem of finding people that are willing to. But at some point right now, um, we're going to start to run out of resource, number one, whether you call that weariness or, or lack of resource. Two, every other historical example of this, and a third party intervention only prolongs but does not change the outcome. And so you know, the issue here is uh, um, where do you sit on this? How do you feel? And there are people who would intervene you know, just purely on the basis of loss of life, um, go near it. Um, and as a nation, we haven't really worked our way to the solution. Um, but I don't see anything that takes me less than 50 years. I think we have time for two quick questions, and they're right next to each other. So why don't we take those two together, and then you can dispense with them collectively. Hopefully they're not as depressing as the last one. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, General. Let me say anyway. Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, General. I'm Shimon Johnson. Um, so uh, we're going back to the uh, new developments and strategic weapons, the directed energy weapons, the real guns, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, invariably, if, as, as, the, as we progress in technology, the, the, we'll, we'll, they'll be, uh, we'll get more of these kind of weapons, and eventually they'll fall into the hands of our enemies. That's what sure. always happens. Do we have, are we doing, um, do you know what kind of research is going on, or what kind of developments are being made into uh, potentially in the future having to counter these kind of weapons? What kind of defenses we'll have, you know, if we're looking, you know, back to like the Aegis system, you know, if another ship or some of the other shore is going to try to, you know, burn a hole in one of our ships, what kind of, uh, what, what we're looking at to try to stop that? Sure. Here, Good afternoon, sir. Midshipman Friels. Uh, as China increases and advances its Navy, what role will the American submarine force play against a lack of such a submarine force in China if tensions were to arise in the, if tensions were to rise in the Pacific? Okay. Um, uh, on the first one, um, what was it? What happens if others get through? Oh yeah. I mean. In the, in the evolution of warfare, the other side has always had weapons. Um, you know, we spent most of World War II not being able to outgun, but we could outrun. 
you know, and we basically ran and we did it with numbers and we swarmed and we did things. So the, the give and take in offense and defense will be a maturation of that activity. We'll have an advantage for some period of time. Somebody else will have an advantage at some point in time, etc. cetera. Um, it's not really, I mean, it is in the will and the capability of the individuals, you know, that the art of war and the ability to pull the pieces together and, pre and prevail is going to be discipline among the forces, etc. I mean, and those are things that, in, you know, that no military in the world is really coming close to us. Um, uh, I and uh, John Abizade, uh, uh, Army General, uh, spent uh, uh, two months ago a week in the field with the Chinese Special Forces in Chengdu. Uh, unbelievably motivated young guys, capable, well-educated. They're 10 years back. I mean, just simple things, but, but it's going to be a while. But they will get there. There's no doubt about it. They will get there. But it's, the issue here is um, whether you have an M16 and I have a, you know, AK-47, at the end of the day, it's going to be more about your training and your capability than it's going to be about that weapon. And, 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 and that's the way that'll work. The second one was the... Future of the subs in China. Subs in China. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you look at um, the capabilities that... Um, the public capabilities, the things you can talk about that are being fielded, the potential for um, unmanned capabilities uh, out there also. Um, the, the lethality and the survivability of the submarine is its premier capability. Okay? Its span of view, its awareness, its area of, of um, regard is extremely small. Um, you know, I mean, and you don't have eyes out there looking, so to speak. You're doing it off of other kinds of sensing. Um, the unmanned are taking for, our, for a sub the, the, on the capability of giving it the leverage of 10 um, just because of the spread, the formation work, the independent robotics that occur out there. They give you the, idea, the area of regard that is almost 10x better than what you have with a single sub. So that's the good news. Um, the harder challenges, um, quite frankly, are going to be the instrumenting of the bottom of the ocean. Um, I mean, that's going to happen. And so nothing's going to be invisible. <laughs> You know, particularly in particular in, in sensitive areas, it's just not going to happen. And so um, the submarine force has a substantial catharsis that's about to, you know, um, display itself uh, in that um, their key role of stealth, their key venue of stealth, is probably changing pretty significantly here over the next three or four years. And when that happens, the belief on the part of the submarine force now is then I have to be ready and I have to have that ability to have 10x the span of control and, and, and maneuver that I demonstrated as a signal in a single incredibly capable vessel. The rest of the world's going to start to figure that out. I mean, you watch out there, uh, I just saw Sweden buy, I think they were buying 10 UVs for, um, for each submarine that they had. You know, I mean, this is this is going very quickly, so um, you know that that world is going to be different um, than it was in the past. The venue of survivability will still be there, but it will not be in the same form that it had been in the past. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, before closing, let me uh, first thank two people who made this possible. Yeah. One is uh, Jeremiah Grandin, and the other is Mary Lou Suarez. Um, I also wanted to thank all of our midshipmen who came out. Uh, in force, and I think you got a uh, good opportunity to see um, the, the facile nature of a senior commander and what you should be aspiring to. Uh, and on that, let me please uh, ask you to join me in thanking the general for uh, engaging us. Thanks. Today. Appreciate it.